Hello guys, good evening, it's time to talk more about Stormgate and uh, I talked about this game for the past couple of days, I had Carson on the show, I talked about it myself, I had a little interaction with you guys and I saw a lot of criticism from content creators on YouTube saying, oh these bigger YouTube channels, they all have a monetary incentive, they just want jobs with Frost Giants, so I thought... I'll be hosting today and I'll be hosting some members of the community that can share their thoughts and their opinion and their criticism and praise of course about the game and two uh, lovely people I got uh, both were at Rara Land both were also on the stream at Rara Land uh, Qbert we saw each other at the War 3 Champions finals now you're back welcome mate Thank you very much, Neo. It's great to be back on stream again. It's been a little while. Uh, unfortunately, not reprised my role as a caster <laughs> since the War Three Chance Finals, but hopefully, get another chance to do that soon. And yeah, it's just it's good to be here, and also with Don Dalare, a very well-known community member as well. Good to have you here as well, mate. Thanks. It's good to know that I'm well known. I think I'm known in some circles, liked by some, hated by others, <laughs> probably, but that's fine. <laughs> I'm the guy that do all the emulation statistics for Neo Stream, so I know if that triggers you or not, but that's uh, what I did at least. I did was was on this stream once before, right? Car casting with Carson for the side games where he got completely destroyed by an um, army. <laughs> 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 you're in a little bit for for the salt you're part of pretty much every single gym king of the hill uh, i mentioned your name uh, a lot of times when we discuss balance uh, but what qualifies yeah. you to talk about stormgate dondo well someone would probably say nothing at all um, someone probably said i should say <laughs> nothing about balance in any game but uh, i mean as most people i'm a huge rts fan i do play warcraft quite a lot i'm not a good player in that game i would say i'm an 80 1900 player but I did play a lot of StarCraft 2. I started playing Settlers 2 as my first game, played AoE 2. All those games I've like been playing on ladder. I was a grandmaster on StarCraft 2. And I was on the beta testing of StarCraft 2. So, uh, sorry, StarCraft 2. So I've been I've been like involved with RTS games for like an eternity now. I'm a pretty old man, so I guess that's what qualifies me. And I'm also very happy to do numbers and like analysis of anything that is compared to like game bound stuff. So I do find it the whole like material very interesting yeah just That's to give you guys just just to give you guys a little bit of a of an insight here usually we do a lot of stuff on the fly we host the cast and we don't really have any talking points dondo comes in here with seven <laughs> word pages of notes <laughs> so of course he does Prepare, prepare. Uh, guys, it's been two days since we've seen the gameplay reveal. Qbert, um, is this your first bigger game release that you're following? Because compared to us, you're still pretty young. Uh, definitely RTS-wise. Um, of course, AoE 4 also was a, a decently major release as well during my lifetime, you know, being an adult and an RTS gamer but one that I wasn't particularly interested in. The only Age of game I ever really loved was Age of Mythology. Close to my heart, that game. One of my favorite all-time games I played as a kid. Um, but yes, this is the only RTS that I'm actually following the development of in progress of. And of course, knowing one of the guys developing the game, as we do, Monk, of course, is also a unique kind of angle that we have there as well. So what do you think about the presentation on Sunday? I felt like it was perhaps a little bit mechanical at the, in its presentation you know it really wanted to hone in on what some stuff like what some of the units can do how the the human resistance faction looks purely just you know aesthetically um showing some of the game mechanics you know we've got two different resources a little bit of the ui is there we see some of the unit names the destructible terrain so we get a lot of things that are just very mechanical aspects and nothing thematic about say the lore or the world i think that's something very important to note um because i don't know about you guys but for me warcraft as much as i actually enjoy playing the game itself and you know loading up a match and playing it out it's the world around it the whole universe you know you've got the characters the voice acting uh the lore everything that's created in the background that doesn't necessarily play a role during a competitive match is still equally as important and i felt that was lacking yeah, I, I kind of I completely agree on that. If you think of like the general game releases, most games or a lot of games have like history or uh, something to dwell upon before, so people have an emotional attachment to the game to begin with. But even like new IPs, usually 
do the most of the trailers and stuff they do in the early parts. Even gameplay releases is very emotionally uh, targeted to like to make you feel as much as you can about the world. And then they kind of hope that the gameplay itself will be good enough to keep people involved in the game. Right? And it kind of been a bit of the opposite so far from Stormgate. So it, well, it makes it interesting to like delve into the mechanics and stuff that we hardcore RTS gamers probably care even more about. I wonder like what the general population thinks when they see like the, tra- the trailer. I don't think it tells you much of anything, and the gameplay reveal as well is it's it was very yeah, I felt like the sign towards the RTS players, like the people that play a lot, not the casual RTS player that play the campaign and maybe some co-op stuff and then quits. Right, I think it was very like targeted towards the look at what we can do in a competitive match uh, audience, which is an important audience, but also not maybe the most wide appeal at the beginning. So yeah, I mean, that's like the main impression so far. So uh, I maybe the, the thought process behind it was that we've seen the cinematic and a little bit of world building last year in the teaser, and now it was about the gameplay. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, I agree. I mean, it was... Uh, then I can also say, like, one thing I kind of missed then is that I felt like game preview... I, then I wanted kind of more gameplay. And I also really... One thing that... Like, if you're actually targeting towards the hardcore audience, I really want to see some first-person stuff for me. Because yeah. everything was, like, from an observer point of view. And that doesn't translate that much to the gaming experience for the player. It more is like it tells you how it will be to look at, in a way. That That's one thing I also missed i missed a bit in that gameplay reveal for myself yeah that's actually a really interesting take dr larry because that's something that's not crossed my mind um but that would have been really sick to see like a camera perspective of of monk playing the game for example against tlo um and actually seeing what it's like to just kind of go through the the buttons while playing with the keyboard and actually having maybe two perspectives that's pretty yeah I, that didn't that thought never crossed my mind but that is actually an excellent point because as you say um, I saw that Frost Giant Studios actually is here in the chat as well, so give them some love, guys. Um, they say that it was a gameplay reveal, so I feel like perhaps if you want to lean into that aspect of it being a gameplay reveal, we needed to go maybe a little bit more all-in in the, on that aspect, perhaps. Yeah. Probably especially, sorry. Uh, go ahead. Especially in this area of like era of uh, streaming and stuff, right? Because you were not, you were a lot more used to see games from first-person views now. That that was like not. That like I remember even StarCraft two far into the game, you were like the first person you used to got were basically videos behind guys with like a cell phone filming what they were playing uh, from the first person view. But now we're kind of used to that through uh, streaming, right? So that's kind of the view we're mostly used to see games from. Not that much from like observing a lot of people at least. I don't know if you followed the entire PC gaming show, but there was one more uh, strategy game or real-time strategy game and we memed a little bit on the name because it's called dwarf and it sounds a little dorky but i think um the the way they designed the trailer was pretty damn good i want to play it here real quick uh because i thought immediately of command and conquer and in general the game doesn't look as good but the way they show gameplay here is a little more interesting i would say is it still playing yeah there's a lot of action very very soon there's there's big explosions everywhere you see the units as well you see some buildings as well this um w- almost feels a little more interesting even though the game looks very much like command and conquer yeah but uh, yeah i agree i mean or i agree that it's a lot maybe more like entertaining yeah it's also a lot more of a command and conquer clone like feel wise i would say than frost giant even though it takes aspects of other games, every game gets inspiration from somewhere, right? But uh, it feels like much closer to like a Red Alert 2.5, maybe, or what you would call it. Um, and I guess the complaint the other way would be if that's what's a hopeful release, people would be, ah, but that's just pre footage, right? That doesn't yes. give you like how you. So you, you're going to get like critique no matter what. And I mean, that's what we're here for in a way. So. <laughs> exactly. But uh, yeah. I, I get like that's a very hard like thing. Maybe the ideal thing would be like a proper longer like yeah, session, right? And the gaming awards is a lot of the games were pretty underwhelming. To be fair. So I think correct. Stormgate looked good anyways on that uh, schedule lineup. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so looking at your notes, Dondo, you want to start this with a little bit of a disclaimer, I read. I mean, uh, the general disclaimer I wrote for myself in notes is that like there's so limited amounts of info, right? Yes. So we 
kind of just we're doing a lot of speculations because it's fun. Also, probably because there's like nothing big Warcraft to stream at the moment. Um, but in general, I mean, we do a lot of speculation and very little info. But we also, I think from what I've heard, Stormgate guys are very, they want as much as possible. So I think it's a good thing that discussions are set early. Um, this game, from what I can tell, is more of a cooperative uh, development than most Blizzard games. We do take feedback, but all, I think they're always more like we have our vision, deal with it. Just accept it to a certain degree and you get like some inputs um so i mean we might be just be wrong a flat out wrong about a lot of stuff though i would also say there's a counterpoint to that but i guess that's the, maybe the next point again um but yeah i mean there's a lot of discla disclaimer is obvious we just kind of we're shooting in the dark right we kind of don't know that much yet especially about setting and like the emotional stuff which is so far very bad for us. To that, so um, when the gameplay trailer was revealed, we we the first thing, of course, we we saw how it looked. What was your reaction to that, Qbert? You like it? You don't like it? So for me personally, um, I like the more cartoony style of graphics. I think we it's maybe a hard pill to swallow for some, but I think that for an RTS to be legible as a game and the, just the general gameplay loop of any match especially competitive games having a game that is overly detailed overly gritty leads to terrible visibility you know poor visibility in game will then lead to higher level players not enjoying the game because they can't tell what's going on now as you've got playing for us right now neo um i'd say the visibility so far is pretty good the colors do pop uh, decently well i think um some of the you know some of the paint could be maybe slightly brighter perhaps the darker colors like blue for example doesn't pop as much as the red to me um the terrain is i would say generally it's quite washed currently i would like to see it be a little more vibrant by the time you know the game releases but obviously we have to expect that that will take some time too and is ultimately not the most difficult thing to improve upon i would say as time goes on but i do i'd like the the art style generally um I really like the way the building just starts constructing there. This is really nice. Um, and it's just quite, you know, immediate action, you know, as as soon as it starts building, it doesn't have to be hyper realistic. It's nice that it just sort of starts constructing immediately. It's like a pop-up tent type animation, which I think is quite satisfying to watch. Um but yeah, generally, no, I like I like the style. I'd like it to be just tuned up a bit graphically. Uh, in terms of fidelity and some more details, but I think that isn't the you know the highest priority for them right now. You're a little bit old, Dondo. You still like the the <laughs> well, comic I, 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 look? I did write in my notes that I personally am not that huge fan of the art style, but I, I, I the one thing I would say is like I don't think that matters much. To be fair, I mean, I played StarCraft Two, it's like the game where I like grew up with. I started Warcraft 3, I was terrible at it because I was pretty young. It wasn't like the Frozen from release party, then I played a lot of StarCraft 2. That's like where I got my RTS proper experience. And that has more of a grim dark atmosphere, right? Like it's a bit darker, a bit... Uh... And that the look that Stormgate has is pretty common in new games. It's kind of... I think everyone has a difficult time to describe it. I don't think the term cartoonish makes any sense. Uh, and it's also not an Unreal Engine thing because every game of different engines have this like, I don't know, this modern look. And and I'm an, I mean, I think this is more of like an yeah, old boomer wants his old game back, like how the game looks. I don't think it's like a, that interesting with critique. So I think the, the important thing is, as Kubert said, is how the visuals function, how the art style functions. And for and I don't have big complaints about that. We have like some stuff that do get a bit mushy and doesn't like look that much. And I also feel like the terrain is my main thing, like it doesn't pop at all. Which it feels like one of the, the it, that that's the most thing that looks like most like the little Dota things. I feel like where the terrain kind of looks a bit washed out. They're like they're like floating on top of it in a way I can't like properly describe. But I mean, graphic fidelity will be the last thing that you're just gonna push a button and it's gonna pop out. So I'm maybe not that big of a worry to be honest. But, yeah, I felt like um, I felt like Reforge was a little bit similar in that aspect too. You know, the terrain felt very very washed out when Reforge came out. And that combined with hyper like detailed models, like my god, what a mess. Right. So at least so far, even with the terrain perhaps not being the way that some of us would like it, and that it would be fairly easy to improve upon. So far, I like the 
the unit models, um, and it, it does stand out quite nicely. I think the buildings look great as well. Um, and we've got a lot of specific details to talk about with the units and the buildings later on, so I won't jump too far ahead. But uh, generally speaking, I think both look pretty good. One point is that, of course, old old dudes like me have like these old games to like hark by, back upon. But the new people that have played, like started playing Dota 2, LOL, they this is like their art style, right? Their main thing. So that's like what yep. they're grown up to. So that's probably a positive thing that you have like this huge influx of new players or new people that liked or like used to this art style. It would be weird for them to maybe take a step back into like the old times. So, yeah. All right. So what I take away from this, you don't have huge complaints about the style and it's not a turn off for you. No. Sure for that. me for me certainly not i think i think it's it's i don't know it's kind of more fun you know what i mean i i don't want to see a game that is overly detailed overly gritty um if i want that i'm just going to play poe2 when that drops so <laughs> <laughs> you probably you know, I, will anyway i will play that as soon as it drops anyway <laughs> just fyi you guys should d4 anyway but uh <laughs> I think we can get our fill from different places, basically, and I, I would like a nice, a nice, vibrant stand, you know, sort of standing out graphics type RTS as opposed to something overly dark, for sure. So, Dondo, how was visibility for you? We uh, talked a little bit about this when I was streaming the second day, I think. Yeah, I mean, you basically hit all the main points. We can like do a bit of a recap. I mean, it's generally pretty good. There's some. I feel like there's a bit too much clutter in the effects. That also, to be said, like maybe the may might be the case in all RTS games, but people that play a lot just turn down the graphic fidelity or like effects pretty much. I mean, if you see in StarCraft Two pros, they play basically like a bare bone version of the game uh, because they, that increases visibility. Uh, so that might just be. I don't think that necessarily bad for the casual gamer, but for the the people that want to play competitively, it's a bit too many explosions that just reduces all map uh, visibility and also. Especially those two human, two Terran units, human units, uh, do kind of blend way too much in together. The, the guy with the Buster Sword from Final Fantasy VII and the <laughs> sniper or the sh rifleman or marine, whatever. Exo, Exo is the. I was about unit. to say, yeah. didn't you learn your vocabulary yet? It's the Exo, the Exo and the Lancer. Yeah, yeah, the Lancer. The Lancer is the one I keep forgetting. Yeah, but Exo I kind of like Buster Blader, like like the Yu-Gi-Oh card. Oh yeah, with the same with the same sword, Buster Blader. It's sick. Should have called it that monk. But I'm, I guess the the one thing is like the, the actually it's the uh, challenge is the design of the two human units, which actually I think you have to change something to make them visible, like compared to each other. The effects is just a tuning thing, and might just be like take the bar that says explosions and like turn it down to twenty percent when you play on your own, if that's a big problem. But uh, yeah, units that look a bit too similar is is a potential big problem in games like this. Yeah, I wonder if this uh, Lancer is supposed to get a shield on like tier 2 or tier 3, right? I wonder if that also gets a visual upgrade, because that would probably help already. Like, you can clearly identify a footman from a rifleman in Warcraft 3, because the one is carrying a big gun and the other is carrying a shield. <laughs> so um, that might be a help already, but yeah, I definitely agree with you guys. Also important to know what an upgrade is there, right? Because I uh, remember in StarCraft 2, you need combat shields to know if you're going to engage or not with Banelings. Sometimes in the early game, it's a good thing that you can see in the difference. Yeah. To be fair, though, Warcraft doesn't do the best job of showing that either. Like, look at long rifles or improved bows, for example. Improved bows, the, the bow doesn't change. Uh, the, the rifle doesn't get longer. <laughs> you, know <what> I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, there's, there's a couple of things like that, too. Um, I think one thing that might be kind of tricky for us too is to look at every detail, you know, super objectively because we're so familiar with Warcraft. Even though you could argue, for example, if I look at an army that's being Blizzard flame strike, can I tell what is going on? The only reason I can react is because lethality is low. But visually, you're like, what the? Like, what's even happening? Yeah, especially if you put a Blizzard on top and then maybe some mortar team. So you got a point there. Yeah. Worst of all is Banshees, right? Like everything no. a banshee does is just—I <laughs> mean, well, curse is okay-ish, but everything else is just oh, impossible my to look at. So yeah, full yeah. of full of uh, bad bad eggs in there as well, for sure. That we've just learned to deal with, you know. And I think you know that's something that the Frost Giant Studios aim to do is obviously learn the lessons of the past, 
you know, and put them into effect for their for their new game. All right, uh, then, Qbert, you said already that you like the buildings. What especially do you like about them? Yeah, I think they. So some of them kind of demonstrate what they're doing quite well, um, and others and others don't. So it's sort of tough sometimes to tell the function of what one building is versus the other, which is maybe a little bit of a negative that could be worked on. You know, you can have maybe punchier animations to show what the building is doing when it's either constructing um, or just doing its idle thing, which I guess could be it does nothing. But um, you know, here, for example, we see the two advanced buildings that produce the, the Vulcan, which is the Gatling gun unit, um, who is very cool. And I really like that unit in particular, especially we'll see later on what he is capable of. But with these buildings here, you could argue what what are they doing? Is it like fission? You know, are they like <laughs> crushing atoms in this like you know mini co uh, collider, or you know, is it something to do with resources? Is it to do with unit production? I think in this specific example, it's kind of hard to tell what it is they're doing. And um, but I'd like the animation though. So perhaps one one question we have to ask ourselves philosophically is: Do we want the animations to always indicate exactly? Um, what the building is doing, or rather that it looks cool. Because in this case, I, I like the actual animation itself, but rather you can't actually tell what it's doing or what sort of building it is at first glance. I'm not that worried about what kind of building, I have to say. I mean, because okay. I, 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 do, I do know like what the impression is, but I think like if you play a game, 20 games, you start to learn like that. Even if there's oh, like yeah. tiniest of differences, you just start picking up on that. And I, I do I do agree that it would be good if there was more like visual clear clearest. But uh, I don't know. I feel like we, there's a well we might just be like we think all buildings are different in the games we used to play, right? But uh, we don't. I think before we, we before we actually have played it a lot, and then we kind of just assume that they're very like significantly tell what they do. Uh, but and I don't. I think they maybe uh, the sign is some of the buildings are very cool looking, and some are a bit bland. I feel like yeah. Uh, 40 yellow but built all the bland buildings <laughs> and monk built all the cool buildings maybe he sure did yeah <laughs> there's always yeah. the question right on, on animation should you actually show what the building is producing it can be visually very cool to see like a void ray being produced from uh from the production facility but it also gives a huge hint on what's coming right so that's a it kind of made they deviate from like gameplay and the extreme version you have aoe2 i feel you never see anything, and suddenly twenty archers pop out because you can garrison <laughs> units as well. So that's exactly like Age of Mythology. Like there's no construction animations, and then you can also garrison. So that is definitely kind of a fatal flaw in in that philosophical, you know, the, the the game design choice, in my opinion. But yeah, perhaps it's not essential to demonstrate exactly what's happening. It's still a flaw, though. <laughs> we we use it flaws because it's a say, game. We liked it, right? Yeah, but, true, uh, true. I think okay. it really kind of think it's cool, right? Suddenly it pops out like four um, catapults and you're, you're thinking you're completely safe and you're just army gets obliterated, right? I think they also think that's a cool part of the game. So <laughs> Maybe they do, yeah, that's fair. We are mired in our like traditions and what's cool, right? I think We really are. Yeah, I would say, I mean, there's going to be biases no matter what, you know. Um, some of us are pure Warcraft gamers. Some have played other games a lot more in the past. Some play Starcraft, some play both, you know. Um, it would be hard to not reference those games in our own preferences for sure. But I do think in that specific example, that's kind of a bit bit crazy, right? <laughs> so you, you basically have no indication of what's going to happen, which I, I don't think is very fun. You know what I mean? Those games are very catered to hardcore players. You know, And then creating something new going forward, I think, has to be more accessible and readable for everybody. Yeah, I agree. It might be like an artificially high uh, skill ceiling. You know, sort Definitely. Of. What do you think about uh, the the size of the buildings and the base build in general? I mean, obviously, it's not as uh, refined as, for example, walling off with the humans in Warcraft. But is that base interesting to you? Is it appealing to you? Can I start this one, Kubert? Yes. I allow you. <laughs> They're way too big. <laughs> they just are. I mean, that's just my, my first impression. Like, that... Every, I mean, it's also like maps can change. I mean, that's completely, but it looks very cramped, like very fast, very cramped, right? Because there's five buildings. Supply depots are usually considered very small buildings in most games, or like supply buildings, not supply depots. But I feel like this game, like already, the dog or the scout looks very, very small, and the buildings are huge. 
person, in my view at least. I would be a bit like trying to see that dog on the right side, the red one, when it's like crossing the gold mine and those buildings in the gold mine are so big. Um, it oh, you can hardly it, see it. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's a bit, it may, maybe a bit too much scaled up so far, maybe, in my opinion. But uh, I also like, I'm, this is also from being a human and turn player that used to be stuck in my base, right? So <laughs> <we're> like yeah, <laughs> losing yeah. games because your siege tanks like cramped behind like 14 other barracks and stuff. And you have to lift them up. So uh, I do like, I, I, wa I want the new RTS to not have a lot of congestion in your base builds. I feel like that's just a pure annoyance. I don't like that part. Personally, I don't like that part of RTS games being like, oh, you built your building one hex too much to the right, so now you're completely busted. Yeah, and, st and, and st from my limited knowledge of StarCraft, you know, for example, playing Terran, um, you know, you can wall off with the barracks and the supply depot, which you can raise and, you know, lower as required. And you usually have a simple wall off, obviously, human and Warcraft, same. You can usually block your base with four buildings. And even good players tend to get stuck later on after a teleport or whatever. We see it constantly. So avoiding that issue is good. And I think having buildings of that size may contribute to some issues later if you need to either build multiple of the same production building, because as far as we understand, we are going to have access to larger armies compared to Warcraft, for example. And we can sort of see the... The, the raised plateau that that base was situated on, it's not the biggest space. And that was only the first like five buildings. Yeah. Um, so I think for, for now, I feel like the number of like micro squares each building takes is too large. And definitely, the, it was great that you pointed out, Don Delari, with, the, with the, the, the scout going behind the, the, the mine, for example, you can hardly even see it. So for now, the buildings are gigantic and could probably do with being scaled down quite considerably because the units already look quite good, I think, in terms of size if you don't have them next to buildings. So for example, here versus the tree line, we've got the sort of bombarding type like siege tank units that throw out this um, like, pla uh, like, um, like ball that explodes, right? So the one near the front near the... The, the, the forest line and obviously the one on the high ground next to the rocks, I think, look look good and make sense in terms of their size. We see the melee units, the lancers running in here look quite good as well. They shouldn't be nearly as tall as the trees, which they're not, so that's nice too. But sat next to buildings, on the other hand, everything looks quite, quite, you know, perspective-wise, it looks a bit looks a little bit odd when you put the small units against the buildings, especially. They look they look minute, I would say, in comparison. All right, let's talk units. Oh, do you want to add to that? Otherwise, you do, I think you need like sixteen units to surround a building, right? I'm just like mathing <laughs> here. That's that's a lot of footmen in Warcraft, for instance. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Let's talk units. Are you excited about the units we've seen so far? Is that something you want to play with, Dondo? What? I mean, they have released four out of. I mean, at least three. I'm trying to remember all the units, are maybe not that like interesting or breaking your grounds. There's one unit that I think everyone agrees is very cool and everyone wants to play around with. That's the Vulcan. Yeah. Otherwise, the I mean, I think they kind of said as well, they kind of want the Terran faction to be a bit of a like a baseline faction. It's it's kind of meant to be a bit like traditional boring. I don't boring. That's a bad word, I guess. Yeah. Traditional. Uh so there's not a lot of stuff is not that new. I mean, a marine is a marine. You, from what we've seen, there's limited stuff to what you can do with it. You can stutter step. That's it. It's going to get shield, so the melee unit is going to get more buff. But so far, we have not seen any abilities yet, right? The only unit we've seen like a proper ability, I would say, is the Vulcan. And that looks interesting to play. Um, yeah, that's like my main impression is that so far a bit dull. I think it has to be fair. I don't think we're breaking like I'm saying anything very controversial there. Yeah, uh, it's it's good to bring up the the actual abilities of the units themselves because my I imagine every unit will have an ability like at least one ability of some kind or even if it's a passive that you research you know for example combat shields or whatever. Um, I do believe for the the exo riflemen, we have the double time upgrade which allows them to increase their movement speed, but if they shoot, they also fire two shots. So basically, it's a speed up into a burst attack that resets their movement speed back to normal. Which is quite interesting, because that's that's different to, say, Stim, for example, which is just a straight uh, buff for both 
but you take damage, so it has a clear drawback and a clear upside. Or like Berserk, for example, for Troll Berserkers in Warcraft, it's the same kind of concept. They have a clear downside and a clear upside. In this case, it's kind of a pure upside. You're going to go faster, which is already amazing. Movement speed is one of the most powerful mechanics in RTS to begin with. And then once you get in range, you will immediately double tap with, say, a whole control group of, of exo soldiers. That is a ton of damage in theory. Obviously, I imagine the damage values will be changed and tinkered around quite a bit you know, before release. Um, so we don't know how lethal that would be in theory. But I could imagine one of the slower, perhaps, mech units or advanced bio units just getting like blown up uh, by being double tapped, basically. But I like the idea that it's kind of fun. Um, and quite quite punchy, you know, you're going to get that immediate speed up, that immediate burst damage. That's quite gratifying, I think, as a gamer. Um, but we'll see if that calls into question perhaps any <laughs> any balance issues further down the line. And I would have liked to see perhaps more of them being used um, during the, the gameplay demonstration, for example, as well. Lancer shields, you know, as a defensive upgrade, it, it's not going to likely look visually impressive or satisfying to using game but if they had a charge you know people would be like oh that's cool but then of course it'd be very similar to the zealot so you know i guess innovation is also difficult while trying to appeal to kind of everybody at the same time yeah and i, I like if you try to do like theory crafting yourself and what units can do and like what roles you need in an army it is pretty easy to just come with the same probes i think it is it is legit very difficult to make like do we need some artillery form do we need some long range, high damage, micro ball stuff? A lot of those things are very easy to get to, I think. So I'm the the critique might be a bit overboard, but uh, I do I do like get why people are like this is in the unit design so far it feels more of like a Starka and 2.5 than most other things. But if there everything has an ability, that's very different from Starka. So that's uh, again we'll see. All right, so we talked a little bit about game plan and a uh, game gameplay and ability already but what about the pure look of things do you like the units if you look at them i suppose we can run through each one quickly don uh sure. we could try to <laughs> we could try to go through each unit so, uh, so we have to like the roman thumbs up or thumb down <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Perhaps, yeah, perhaps that would be more efficient. You can you can just thumbs up, and then I'll, I can talk about them quickly. <laughs> nah, feel free to chime in, of course, um, if you have something to say specifically. But we have the worker unit, um, probably the most one well, of the most overlooked in any game, really, but also important. The Bob, uh, kind of a smiley faced robot, is kind of entertaining. Um, I don't think it's too childlike. You know, I think that's kind of fine to have some little fun elements in there it doesn't have to be super serious so that's fine the scout being sort of like a robotic dog is an interesting choice as well like it's not another vehicle it could it could have easily been something like a vehicle or another humanoid unit another bio unit and that would have just added to the list of like units that are similar so that's um definitely nice as well it's clear to see of course in the footage too that portraits are not finished they're either placeholder or they've not been animated yet. So that will obviously be changed further down the line as well, I imagine. The Lancer, of course, I, I like the the large, you know, Buster Blader type sword they've got. I think that's really sick um, as well. I actually would like to see the blade be a little bit longer as well, because the hilt is really huge, like where, where you actually hold the sword, but the blade itself isn't super long. Um, apart from when the, the Lancer actually strikes, I'd like to see it maybe be a little bit longer. This is just insanely nitpicky and, and just my own preference um, but I like the aesthetic of the unit but then you compare it with the EXO which is the, the rifleman slash soldier type unit um, it's obviously quite similar in appearance because of the armor plating right? both the Lancer and the EXO share some plating, you could even argue that the bobs are also armored as well, or at least they look like they have some sort of dark kind of black grayish uh, hue to them as well, just like the EXO and the Lancer's and of course, when we see it here on the Vulcans as well, the sort of black grayish chrome, at least on those units, of course, they have a lot more paint on them. They're a lot larger, so it's more distinguishable. But smaller units having the same sort of like uh, grayish plating, I think makes it kind of hard to tell. You know, it makes it harder to distinguish those units, even if each perhaps looks aesthetically pleasing on its own. Um, the med tech, of course, the medivac, basically if I'm not mistaken, or is that the actual unit that's on the floor? That's the unit on the floor. Um, do you have a clear shot of that one, Neil? 
Uh, not really a clear one, but I think you can see them here. Ah, uh, yeah. They're in the middle left right now, where my mouse hovers over. Yeah, so in this case, of course, we see here that they've got paint, uh, sort of, you know, the, 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 the player color paint, as well as white in amongst the sort of grayish plating. So that obviously helps them stand out significantly more. And of course, also coincidentally, you know, white and red, kind of the, the healer kind of colors, I guess. <laughs> The, the Hippocratic sort of colors. So they're very uh, distinguishable, I think, and noticeable, you know, they pop out a lot more because of that white color in them as well, which I like. Um, what are your thoughts on that, Don Delaria? Because we can't see your face right now. Oh, you are can't? You, are, you, are you pleased? Um, well, I don't know if you can, why you can't see my face. Oh, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty pleased. I feel like the Marine uh, is a bit, it's like probably the most boring unit, but it's also like the most, you've seen it 10,000 times, so that's, Totally fair. Uh, the medic is a bit interesting. Just this is also very like tiny thing, but all priest medics usually are very like small and slim and just like they're like the tiniest units in the game. And this is like the most bulky medic. Yeah, it's very bulky. In the game, mm -hmm. Which is, I don't know, I kind of like the concept of like these huge bulky medics <laughs> doing like a support role. Um, the it's, one uh... unit you haven't gone through is the one I like the least though. Yeah, I just wanted to get your thoughts because it is a fairly long <laughs> list of stuff actually no, but in also, general I, I like and i love i actually think the scout is very cool just i mean yeah. I, there's people arguing if like it's terrible it's a robot it's fine they're very cool yeah also just to mention about the the um, the med tech is also it sort of reminds me of baymax true from uh from that movie, which I can't remember the name of. Baymax. <laughs> is it just called Baymax? Yeah, is it just called Baymax? Yeah, called Baymax? <laughs> <laughs> well, it looks exactly like him, which is kind of fun. So the Atlas, which I think is a cool name for a unit to begin with. That's also nice. I think, for, I, not a minor detail, but I like unit names being cool. I don't know about you guys, but whenever like I, I was young and I would like make a Warcraft 3 map and just change the creep names to stuff, instead of Ogre, Mauler, you know, it'd be like Ogre Bone Crusher, you know, just <laughs> I was always a nerd for that kind of stuff. I like kind of cool names for things. I think Atlas is a pretty uh, nice name. And also its upgrade is called Purification Ordnance. That's sick. That kind of describes pretty much exactly what it's going to do, doesn't it? Rip casters. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll never learn that. Never. <laughs> uh, oh, I know, right. That's That's rough. Um, but I like the unit design as well. I think it's, you know, the sort of nice dark tank, you know, siege tank-like unit that sits in the back um, is very noticeable straight away. You've also got the yellow in amongst there as well, um, which makes them stand out very nicely. So I think they're immediately distinguishable as well, uh, which is obviously good. Uh, we have the evac transport, um, which we've seen a bit as well. Um, Monk doing his best to micro those units there with the, <laughs> with the, uh, the evac transport as well. And we'll see if you can bring that up on screen as well momentarily. There we are. Um, I really like the sort of green orbs with the green light you know, coming out. It's kind of UFO-like almost, actually, the, the, the evac transport here. Also nice and distinguishable. Um, and of course, the Vulcan, which I think is everyone's kind of favorite unit so far. I would say you've got this large sort of biomech, you know, unit with a Gatling gun. It has a clear wind-up animation that's quite punchy, which I like. It, it, you know, look at the, the DPS of those boys. They're really nice. They have piercing rounds that go through multiple units. They have a charge, which uh, in that very clip there, I think uh, Monk only hit one unit with. But, <laughs> you know, they have so much potential, I think, as well in their design. You know, we see them being able to mow down multiple units. Perhaps their damage could even be tuned up, you know, over time as well. And we'll see also some uh, terrain interaction as well later on, which is very, very cool as well. So yeah, sorry for the long spiel. Just want to go through all the units. I think they're pretty pretty cool. Um, just a couple of the ground forces bio, you know, bio units could maybe have something to distinguish them a little bit better. Maybe the combat shields could be uh, quite punchy, or the blades perhaps could be elongated or something, just to make everything as clear as possible. I don't, the one the only unit I can like command. I, I agree totally on everything. So, and uh, again, I don't personal preference. There's like it's personal preference, right? So it doesn't matter. And I really agree that unit actually unit names, no, even upgrade names are actually pretty important. I think people to get involved in stuff. Uh, one huge problem in StarCraft Two is like all the upgrades now have like these very difficult names. Even like the casters are like the the banshee thing. 
just give up like, <laughs> member stuff after a while. You mean like um, the cloak ability? No, the, they, they have like the ability to make them go faster, right? And they changed the name like three times. Uh, Really, so, uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. like <laughs> at a certain point, like yeah, guys were just like yeah, the thing that is our afraid thing. Uh, but cool, <laughs> cool, cool names are often a cool thing, and you sometimes forget if you think the unit is cool or like the name has become cool of the unit, or vice versa. I feel for a lot of these games. Uh, the one unit, the one unit I just don't like. I could just say personal preferences. I don't like the Atlas. I think it looks very dorky. It looks like a beetle. I think if I might just be scarred from the beetle siege engine discussion in StarCraft two that lasted for like two years. I well, see yeah. what you mean, actually. Yeah, yeah. There, it does look like a Crypt Lord to a degree. Crypt Lord, yeah. Evil, yeah. Uh, it's it does have a very beetle like you know posterior basically, and the 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 head as well. It's, it's just something with the way it's placed. It kind of looks like it's face planted in a way. I don't can't explain it. I just don't. I'm not like a huge fan. But I mean, personal preference. As so, far so. as I heard, this was already changed. Oh, to, okay. to a degree in the newer build because people couldn't differentiate if uh, it's deployed or not so they changed yeah. the look a bit already in a newer version i think this is what monk told me but it could be wrong no i th yeah. actually think you're correct yeah because he totally said that in an interview but i'm not sure if he meant that from the gameplay reveal or from the like animation video that well hmm. one of those two i guess let's see what about the science vessel though you want to talk about the science vessel I don't think it's finished. I think that's like the. I think that's what everyone thinks. I don't think it's like properly finished yet. It's very doesn't say much of anything, and it's it's like both pretty derivative, but it doesn't pop in like any way. What it's supposed to. It's just a like green floating thing, um, in a way. Which, yeah. which is kind of similar to the evac transport as well. You've got the sort of green orbs and the UFO sort of lighting to it as well. Um. Perhaps it needs something to make it slightly more distinct against other aircraft. Of course, would there be other races factored in, you know, the contrast will be even greater. But if there's going to be a human resistance mirror, <laughs> then perhaps there needs to be a little bit, uh, a slight redesign to make that unit pop off a bit more in particular compared to, say, the evac transports. Because, you know, you're going to have those probably boosting in and collecting your troops and bringing them back. And then you've got those science vessels in the middle as well. So, you know, there's a bit of... Uh, visual clutter there potentially all right we talked a lot about visuals uh is there anything else about the visuals that you guys want to touch on otherwise we would slowly move towards gameplay go gameplay go gameplay time Let's to kill it. the biggest thing that everybody and all the communities are talking about is time to kill the starcraft people think the time to kill is too long the warcraft people think the time to kill is still too short uh it's worst of both worlds apparently everybody hates it <laughs> you want to go first Kubert? i can add well, i guess there but yeah because i'm gonna have probably a far more general opinion on this compared to either of you guys because that's something that could be tweaked super easily all units can have you know, all units have HP, armor, and damage ranges, or just, it doesn't even matter if it's a range or not, but they have certain levels of damage, and that can all be tuned up or tuned down very, very easily in any editor, right? So that could be changed. Um, and I would say what they displayed so far, um, some stuff looks pretty lethal. For example, the artillery, like the Atlas, looks strong if it actually hits its target, right? The weaker units blow up pretty fast at the back. Um, I think the snipe, uh, sorry, the sniper, the exo DPS is very high as well when they actually get in range to fire all at once, especially perhaps when their upgrade comes into play. That would be insane. Um, but for example, the Vulcans, I feel like should be really mowing down units far more easily given their size and probably cost and the amount of supply they take up. And it feels like they're not really actually punching through uh, units very easily. Like you can see one shooting the exos in the back and it's taking like. Like, I don't know, maybe 15 shots or so to actually kill <laughs> a basic rifleman. And it's supposed to have, you know, a Gatling gun that should be able to do probably more DPS. And if the piercing effect as well, which is going to be hard to probably abuse in game because you'll be able to split units around kind of like Marines so that they don't take as much AoE effect from other units that deal damage like that. Then, you know, you're not really getting that much damage out of a unit that's probably very expensive and also not the most mobile. You think yeah, they make I mean, the time to kill for us a little longer, Dondo, because we're old and we can't react as fast as the StarCraft well, kids? 
we, we get like a bit of a difficult thing to consider here, right? Because if we know that the numbers are not close to tweak, just like pure balance damage wise between the units, but it, that also makes it a bit hard for me to actually engage with the time to kill would be. I think like what they're going for is what they're saying. I'm trying to keep that in mind that maybe the Vulcan like isn't actually tuned up in the game compared to what they want it to be. So because like I do feel like it's very much on the slow side. And I do feel it damages some units a lot more than others. The, the artillery strikes are a bit weird because in the one clip they do actually it seems like they one kill a marine unit. And the other clip when TLO's uh like forcing his way into Monk's base, there's like his direct artillery shot on like six exo units. They take like fifteen percent damage or something. And then that unit becomes more or less useless because you can dodge it so easily those i would I mean, even old me i think i could dodge some of these shots pretty easily. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you have like stuff like that right so it kind of makes it hard to tune there there are like stuff that's connected to time to kill that has like like further ramifications that makes it a bit hard to prop to decipher i think people look at it very isolated that like oh i want the game faster or slower and that's just that's just like a pure tweak this button and you get like that I think there's a lot of interactions that go th- that ends up with what the final time to kill would be, right? So if artillery units uh, theoretically have a very high lethality, but they never hit, then they basically have the time to kill is endless, or like it, it's never ending. And you have that in Warcraft, right? We say that the time to kill in Warcraft is very slow, and that's true if a grunt hits a grunt. If you're getting Coil Nova at levels 3 and 3, that is not a very slow process, I think most people would agree. <laughs> so, so you have like these processes that make time to kill a bit more fluent than I feel like what people seem to be targeting. Like this, they they remember like a bane link bust or a tank shot, and they're like, that's the time to kill compared to this exact thing. Mm-hmm. We need a lot more gameplay to like actually feel what the time yeah, time to kill is. But there are, I feel there's like certain connections that like I kind of want to talk a bit about in like. How, what it can the one thing that I actually worry or worry I wonder most about, which people don't talk about when they talk about time to kill, is comeback mechanics. I think that's actually a very interesting thing. Time to, uh, talking about that. Yeah, Warcraft, go ahead. Stage is yours. Because yeah, this is my like thing. In Warcraft, if you're a bit behind, you have like comeback mechanics such as upkeep. That's an economic economic uh, um, comeback. But you also have heroes in themselves being such as powerful as they have. You kind of never want to quit a game unless you feel like you're completely lost, right? Because you can always get that nuke off. You can do like some stuff with that. StarCraft 2 has less elegant solutions, uh, solution, but the high lethality works as a comeback mechanic in itself. You drop two Widow Mines, probe line, you kill 20 probes. You had a horrible start. You're now even. Everything's fine. Like That, of course, is like always also a source of frustration, but it's important to keep people in the game. And like make make the games interesting. If you have very high or maybe sorry low time, high time to kill takes a long time to kill stuff, and you don't have stuff like heroes. I feel like if you come back, if you get behind, there might be very a big limitation to how you can get back into the game. It's it's like my first idea of like how that could work, right? Because in Warcraft, if you're if you were like twenty food behind or something from a bad early game, and you didn't have heroes, I think the game is just like completely lost, no matter what you do. As long, as long as players are somewhat equal in skill level. So that's the thing I'm wondering a bit about with the lower time to kill without heroes. Because I think the big lethality in a lot of RTS games without heroes is because you need something to like keep the game on edge, even if there are like some advantages in economy, food count, etc. That's the one thing I wonder about. I mean, you have micro potential, etc. But yeah, I think that that's a bit more limiting if you don't have high lethality as well. That's the one thing I'm kind of like worrying about, or worrying, worrying is the wrong word, but I'm interested in how you can fix in a unit-based, slow time to kill RTS game. I'm definitely unsurprised you bring up such an astute point, Don Delari. Um, <laughs> yeah, because in Warcraft, you know, lethality is like very low at the start of the game. Hero levels are low, you have fewer units, so everything kind of dies quite slowly. You pit certain units against each other, you know, you could be there for a long time in theory, you know, before a unit dies. And what I guess is important to note, you're talking about comeback mechanics, is as a game goes on, if, for example, you start losing the fight in Stormgate, 
and you don't have, as you said, a powerful hero to rely on, perhaps it could bring you back to the game or an item, etc., something that turns the tide of the of the fight. Then basically, whoever is getting an edge in the fight just snowballs out of control in that engagement. They will outright annihilate the opponent in the engagement, and then how is the other player supposed to come back? In those cases, it's not like they're going to, as you said, you know, widow mines are a great example because they're so strong um, and kind of pesky to deal with and hard to see when they're coming and they just like drop it and blow everything up, right? Um, you know, something like that to bring you back into the game just like that. Or in Warcraft, you know, as you said, you know, a nuke from a hero or, you know, an item or something like that that can turn the battle in your favor. So that's actually, yeah, I think it would be, be really good to actually hear from Frost Giant Studios on that particular question because from a higher level gameplay point of view, that is a very, very important question to address. Yeah, they said they're going to use these creep spots as a comeback mechanic. To be honest, even with Monk explaining this to me, I'm having a hard time imagining how that's supposed to work. They can also have the complete opposite effect. That's what I mentioned in the interview, and he said, oh, no, it's going to be fine. Okay. (laughs) Because the only way, like, a player behind in units probably can take a creep camp is either out maneuvering or that they're spread out on the map so they can take each of their own right but then it kind of evens out so yeah it's it, that's like the only thing i'm a bit like worried about if the ptk is sufficiently low and you don't have like a lot of lethality in general in the game um so yeah uh i think the like the nightmares and not nightmares in our, but the most annoying games you are playing yourself in these games are when you're far behind and you're like why did i stay in that game for 35 minutes even though i felt i was lost the whole way but in those games you kind of always have a bit of hope but if you know that that hope is completely like gone it's just pure frustration i i think i know this I like other they have like been like command and conquer the games have very small competitive scenes but i think that's more common there like that you actually feel like you're kind of just dragging the game out if you get like slightly behind and get snowballing etc cetera, et cetera. so it's an interesting topic i think in general uh chat is suggesting uh creep jacks that kind of depends on the creeps i mean the chicken wasn't really impressive but if you fight someone like uh, roshan and dota and then there's a creep jack that could, of course, help, but I think we have to uh, wait for more details on that. What's yeah, the... and it's like... Yep. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I was just, just going to say quickly, like in Warcraft, regarding creep jacks, um, creep jacks could be prevented, you know, with, with good scouting or good game sense, knowing where your opponent is. If you were behind in the game, you could still prevent it from occurring, essentially. Or we use other mechanics, like dragging the creep camp out away from the spot and maybe surrounding... The, the item carrying creep and then scurrying off before you get creep jacked or things like that. So we may see something similar too. You know, you want to drag it out towards your side of the base, towards your base or away from where you think your opponent is coming from. So that may perhaps be good enough, but also the reward aspect would have to be immense because if it's just pure resources, resources don't provide you with an immediate benefit. You know, if you, cre- if you, uh drop a book of the dead in warcraft it might save your ass in a fight right there and then you know from a bad situation but if i get 200 you know primary resource i'm still going to have to wait to see the benefit of that by the time the next unit is produced or the next production building which then produces a unit or a tech that's being researched come into effect and onto the field to see value from that it doesn't provide any immediacy like items do for example in warcraft All right, what's next on the menu, Dondo? Okay, I can't remember. Let's see what we're about to... Well, ability interaction is the main next point I had, but uh, kind of did. But I, I can say, like, we still haven't seen much of them, and I'm looking very much forward to that point being, like, further introduced. I like, I very much like the concept of units having more... And then they need to have more stuff to do, I think, to make, like, the game stand out. Is so, that I, so? I, I, I think so, yeah, because, I mean, otherwise it just... Then that StarCraft or like AOE, like all those comparisons become a lot stronger. And it's, I think the competition is more difficult for them if they don't stand out in like any direction. And also, I just, I don't, I just find it more interesting. Uh, in, in Warcraft, I think you could have even, bo- you could have even more boring units. I don't think that's a good idea either, but you're always going to be saved by the heroes, right? Because the heroes are like such interesting mechanic. Um, 
AOE is a bit weird in this way, but units are very different, and they have like very like straight counters and stuff that kind of also makes the game flow a bit like better maybe. And also you have some units are like extremely microable in that game, uh, cavalry archers, etc. Like a good player can beat anyone below his level without losing a unit, I think, unless they're like sufficiently good enough. So they do need something. I I find it somewhat interesting. Like the, I'm looking forward to the design because the Vulcan ability. This is just my 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 name immediately. It stun. It goes dash forward, stuns the unit, but its main damage output is stay fire in a cone for a while. <laughs> I don't. Know, that seems illogical to me. It's just like I don't know if that matters. It's just it might just be a good thing or not. I'm just I'm looking very forward to how these interactions work. Is uh, my mind is like immediately going to like how can you use them and utilize them? It's going to be very beneficial also for creative players, which I think um, are kind of left in the dark often in a lot of RTS games after like the early honeymoon period when the macro monsters or micro monsters kind of take over. I think it's cool if the creative players have more outlets to stay relevant in the competitive scene. I think the, the Vulcan is an interesting example because with a unit with such a long wind up and that would preferably to would, would be at sort of a moderate distance where they can start the wind up animation and start unleashing a bullet hell, why would they have a dash that lets them go forward in that case? You know what I mean? They're definitely a unit that will want to stay somewhat of a medium distance from their opponents, probably, so that they can shoot from afar, because there's probably no range penalties, I imagine. Maybe like a Dawn of War, for example, you know, there's like cover systems, and units can do less damage or more damage, depending where they're standing, blah, blah, blah. Um, but the dash can be used very well defensively, on the other hand, for example. We do see them dash back as well in the footage, and actually destroy terrain, which is very, very sick. Um, so I could see it being used purely defensively because these units are not going to be mobile. If they're caught out, it would be a disaster. Maybe they're going to be very expensive. Uh, but the dash in while dealing a stun, is it sort of feels like, are you going to do that with those sorts of units? You know, Imagine you, you use two or three of them, but you dash into like 20 exos. You know? It's just like they're going to get annihilated in close range. So I don't know if it's something that conflicts sort of philosophically with what the unit is supposed to do, or if the if Frost Giant Studios intend for you to actually always use it defensively and just throw in the stun mechanic in there. I'm I'm very curious about that. Yep. I agree. All right. Um then is the more we, we talked about the creep spots a little bit. We didn't talk much about RNG in general, they said at the creep spots, um, the drops are predetermined, so there's no uh, no drop table or anything. You will know what you'll be going for, and from what we gathered from the interviews with Mog, also, like damage values are predetermined. Do you like or dislike the lack of RNG? Dislike <laughs> immensely. But, uh, I mean, I understand the reasoning, so I, I mean, and I think this is just like a pure philosophical question in a way. Uh, games that don't have our RNG work, games that don't uh, work, I don't think it has to be bad, but um, I do think it takes away some like interesting stuff, right? That Warcraft has uniquely. But, and also, I think it's pretty common in like all RTS games to have it, so it's kind of new also when I think about it. Even StarCraft 2 Vito Mine shots are not actually RNG, but they very much feel like RNG. Uh, so you actually you need something that kind of makes like the game shake up a bit. Where you, the element that you can't always perfectly control everything is probably important both from the viewing experience. Observers, I think, would have a more fun time, but also I think as a player. It, it just gives like these random wow-ish moments, which I think is pretty good. You, you can make like so semi, not RNG, but you can have stuff like the, uh, the creep um, Stuff being like scalable to your army size, so it's not random, but it's kind of you kind of stuff that involves like some development from just like the pure game starts. This is what it is from the get go. But uh, yeah, yeah, in general, I think we all like RNG, or else we wouldn't play Warcraft. If you hate RNG and you play Warcraft, you have a horrible time. I think. Well, I do like the good RNG. I hate the bad RNG. I was just about to say shout out Todd. <laughs> um, but, uh, <laughs> Dude, how <laughs> is it that Todd gets a shout out in every single <laughs> things of these I do? There's too many applicable concepts to him, yeah, but uh, that's true. Yeah. no, um, I'm pretty on the fence about this one actually. Um, I think a lot of gaming nowadays, just in a very general sense, 
it sort of relies on on companies giving their consumers like that dopamine hit at least now and then for almost any sort of game because games have to give you some sort of satisfaction while playing it you know uh, relentlessly grinding a game that gives no sort of sense of accomplishment or dopamine rush isn't going to keep people playing it is it so that is important and of course the rng aspect invokes emotion regardless of it being negative or positive if i play a game of warcraft and get three rings i'll cry but at least you know i feel emotionally invested in the game i'm playing or if i get three claws then i'll be jumping for joy so i think that removing an emotional component perhaps and having no rng will hurt the game but i'm more i would rather take the opinion perhaps of the highest level players in say warcraft and starcraft to see how they feel about how it would impact them long term as of course those are the guys that are going to be actually grinding the game um and trying to get you know to to a level where they can play professionally and would they what would they say you know does it affect them to play a game that has its rng aspect removed but for me as someone who is sort of like a casual but takes the game seriously if he wants to type person hybrid man <laughs> then for me personally removing the rng is a little bit sad yeah it just takes the x factor away i do agree with you i think if you ask the the players on the very highest level especially in starcraft they want to get rid of it they want to calculate absolutely everything to the tiny little uh or tiniest bit uh because they are on such a high level but uh this this seems to be made for the average joe not first and foremost, but uh, with that in mind, and the average Joe would, I guess, benefit more than being hurt from RNG, but that's just my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's also just, it's just a core component uh, component of a game we like, right? So I think that's yeah. totally fair to feel like it. Yep, 100%. Uh, a core aspect of what we brought to War 3 Champions, for example, is a feature uh, that we can zoom out. What do you think, uh, like, we are getting so used to being able to zoom out and zoom in. Uh, now at Stormgate, we've only seen this one zoom level, and we have no idea if this is customizable. So do you think the camera height is good? Is that uh, the perspective you want to have for the next 10 years in RTS gaming? I'll make mine short and snappy if that's okay, Dondo. <laughs> um, just... So, for example, the camera angle here, I think, is pretty good if that was what it actually looked like for the player. And you have a very good overview of the fight there that's taking place on the left. But for the actual um, in-game perspective, when, for example, the, the buildings were being constructed near the start of the game, oh. with the size of those buildings, like this, this is a good example, right? So we're already very zoomed in to begin with, and the buildings are huge. And that's something I want to actually tag on a little bit early when we discussed the buildings very quickly is the zoom level would help immensely as well if you were zoomed out more then everything would look a little bit more readable as well but of course as we already talked about the buildings need to be a bit smaller in our opinion but also being more zoomed out is going to help that aspect as well this uh, battle that's taking place here i think is pretty decent as well but then you have to imagine the ui on top of that you know and how much that would actually block you wouldn't be able to see some of the structures at the bottom there and probably a couple of things you know in the corners so yeah it needs to be customizable 100 percent you know we're, this is 2023 you know modern games are being created now i would say at this point please we need to have features that can be toggled at the player's whim you know things that can be changed on a sliding scale that is nice and easy to use in this dynamic you know and nothing that's kind of either like bad presets that you have to scroll through just allow it to be a nice sliding scale that is easy to control in either increments or with your with your mouse. And it definitely has to be customizable by the players, for sure. Yeah. In our I, notes, I, have... I see a sentence that is written in big, bold letters, Dondo. <laughs> 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 uh, well, yeah, I mean, the, the obvious thing I would say is that if they want team games to be a big factor and... I'm guessing the army serves like 40, 50 food. I think they said something along those lines. I think we see the UI for like a split second and say something. Along. And they also said in the chat, I remember like uh, the armies are going to be far bigger than four guys. If you have six players on that screen with full armies, I don't think you see anything. Like legit, I don't, especially with explosions effects and stuff. So I think that's like an argument just to 
be able to zoom out in like big fights on team games. I think that's arguable. I also I struggle a bit with the whole idea of not being able to zoom out as a, just a pure quality of life. People are a bit different in what they want to do. Some people maybe don't want to micro that. Like, uh, I mean, you sacrifice something with zoom levels no matter what you do. You can micro like happy if you're zoomed out as foggy. Or as foggy used to. He's actually zoomed in again. This is an interesting development in the foggy. Uh, no, that's cool. <laughs> but, uh, but in general, I mean, do sacrifice something, right? And also, you have fog of war in RTS games. So as long as you can't zoom extremely out, I don't, I don't see you like why being able to zoom out a bit more should be a problem. I feel like disregarding just like the pure, what should be the best. I just feel like it's a weird quality of life thing to not have included. And the reason I bring it up pretty strictly because I think and Monk can be perfectly fine to quarter me and just hang me out in the streets if I misrepresent him here. I think he kind of said that relating towards not being able to change zoom. Uh, and I, I just feel like that's very, for a game that's like want to be groundbreaking, that feels so like linked to a traditional view of like how games work. I don't know. Uh, it just doesn't suit well with me. And I think it might be like a legit problem for team games. And if they want to make team games a big thing, that you need to be able to see more than you can do at the screens we have seen so far. Maybe not only team games, but also thinking one step further, they want to bring in, uh, user-generated content and custom maps can be super crazy. Uh, for example, in like battle tanks, we're super zoomed out. Um, that could be something you can do with the editor, but yeah, uh, customizability would be pretty nice indeed. Uh, next point on the menu is the resources. I'm still not 100% sure if I understand the concept of the two resources perfectly. Are you feeling that you have a good idea of what we're mining in Stormgate? You mean in a very real sense, like what is it that we're actually extracting from the ground? Yeah, or uh, how it works. Well, how it works is easier to explain than what it actually is, I guess, because that's up to uh Frost Giant's interpretation of what things actually are and what they what, what they do. But we have Luminite, which is the primary resource, which is essentially like gold in Warcraft or minerals in StarCraft 2. Um, so far, it seems to be the case that the way the resources are collected is different and it is not uh, like a static value increase depending on how many workers gather from the same mine. So for example, uh, from 12 workers here, if I understood correctly, if you were to lose two workers, it's not the same as going down in terms of, um, let's go with easier numbers. So say, for example, the maximum was 10 and you dropped eight workers, you didn't lose 20% of your gold income, but rather, you know, I'll pick an arbitrary number like 9% or something. So every additional one you lose would cost you more in terms of gold efficiency, but not the same value per worker. And it also appears to be the case that if you oversaturate and go above 12, then you would have diminishing returns, which makes logical sense anyway. But I think if I also understood correctly, the values are not fixed. So having three workers is not three times as efficient as a single worker, if I'm not mistaken. Then we have, so that's probably the easiest resource, I guess, so far. Yeah, that I understood. Got, yeah. The next one is Ethereum which I think people compared a lot to Command and Conquer's secondary resource, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and also, interestingly, there is a similar concept to another game, but I'll explain that in a moment. So Ethereum you know, is like Vespine, it's like Lumber. It's what enables technological units, upgrades, research. Um, that's all fairly logical. I also like that they stuck with a two resource structure. Um, I don't know if you ever played Dawn of War 1, but for example, the Orcs faction have a, a wow resource as well, which is really hard to manage. It makes no sense. Um, um, I don't know about Age of Empires, but Age of Mythology, for example, has three different, actually it has four different uh, resources you collect. So two keeps it nice and simple. But I kind of like the concept that the Ethereum doesn't, um, sorry, that it does in fact uh, continue to grow and expand sort of so let's say that it, it's sort of like vines you know that sort of kind of they keep growing and spreading around it's not going to be a massive area i assume but the fact that it does actually flourish if it is not being collected gives it a very organic feel literally which is kind of cool as a concept i would say um how that would be applied in game though i guess 
remains to be seen because would you prefer to expand further out onto the map and then work your way towards yourself and reserve say huge amounts of Ethereum for the late game this actually happens in age of mythology for example you have gold mines um some of which have larger amounts in them than others and the big ones are sometimes close to your base you want to reserve them for later um so i don't know you know how that will affect the actual gameplay loop itself in a competitive match but i kind of i kind of like the concept that one of the resources is more organic it isn't just a static thing you collect what do you guys think man for the numbers dondo <laughs> well, I'm not going to do math here because I don't have any math to go on. But uh, I'm so think... disappointed, dude. <laughs> uh, Baron, I expect me. Yeah, I wrote in chat, so <laughs> but uh, sort of disappointed. No, I think. Well, I have a, like a, I don't know I might be a bit boring view on resources in RTS games. In most RTS games, they're like they, you need them to make like the the whole like economy work system. But I also don't find them like interesting at all usually. Like, of course, it's interesting in a balanced sense. You can like do stuff like that, but I don't feel like the resource gathering portion of most RTS games are that interesting. So in one way, I don't care that much how it's designed. I do think it's a bit interesting that from what I understand, you know, that like the, the resources are more split in what you use them for than you are used to in Blizzard RTSs, where it's kind of like a combination of um, crystal gas and a combination of uh, uh, gold and wood to build stuff. You have, of course, like gold this has uh, extra uses in Warcraft. In general, you do like you do a bit of both, right? That's like the main usual RTS staple. While, for what I know, like, from what I understood, they kind of want to split like the usage rates of the resources more than what we're kind of used to in other RTS games. So, also the decision of what you want to do with resource one or two is a bit more like complicated. And just I want another base with both resources, which is pretty like an easy decision in most RTS games, right? It's a pure plus, no matter how you put it. Uh, that might be interesting as a concept. I don't know. I haven't. We don't kind of don't know what we can use both resources for, etc. Right. Um, the other thing, I mean, the only game I feel like where uh, resources are actually interesting of the big artists that I've played is Age of Empires. Not because the resources themselves are that like extremely uh, uh, creative or anything, but you have a lot of ways to uh, get them in. Like right? so, in the early game, you can go hunting. You can uh, you can build farms earlier, you can go berries, certain civilizations have advantages towards those maps that have uh, sea uh, gathering stuff, right? So shore fish, sorry, shore, shore fish. So you have a lot of like components there to like how and like where you should build your wood, like first stuff and etc. cetera. Uh, I, that's like the most interesting, I feel like way of resource because actually placement of stuff and like where you want to build your outputs and stuff matters more than it's, from what I can read so far, does the storm get to food? even though they split resources more, also have more of the traditional gather these resources, build that stuff and like in the in basis, like on the map. But we'll see. I thought you were going to have more like mobile gathering and stuff, but it doesn't seem to be that way so far with the, like you need a building to have that and you want to defend that building. So yeah. Uh, I mean, if it's not that interesting, it's not the core part of the game for me anyway. So that's kind of like a thing, but I think there's possibilities to make cool stuff out of resource gathering. I'm not sure this is like the. I'm entirely convinced that this is it. I don't know. We'll see about that. Maybe you're more interested in destroying some trees and terrain yeah, manipulation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean that's cool. I mean it seems very simple and people are lambasting it. I was also like a bit. We know that games can you can destroy trees in actually most games, but the, the way you do it is very clunky, right? Mortars or they do an AKM, then it's pretty fast. You just do plane strike everything. Uh, <laughs> or, um, <laughs> but um, I mean, usually it's pretty like it's so slow that it doesn't work, and maps are not usually made for that to be used in any way. It's more like uh, you can limit resource gathering to a certain degree for your opponent. I think those concepts are cool. There's a very fine line between being very cool and being extremely annoying, which is always difficult to balance in maps, but that's more a map design thing than anything else. Like rocks in StarCraft 2 are kind of cool, but it's also the most annoying thing to try to like a tank is sieging on the other side, or if you have plateaus to your main base, stuff like that can be almost game breaky or just very annoying to deal with to a degree that it makes map um, map um, development pretty difficult, especially in the early parts of all RTS games. But that I don't think that should limit the uh, limit the possibilities to do a cool stuff. I think that's a uh, very interesting, like yeah, it's stuff to expand upon. I hope they have a lot more stuff like that. I feel like genuine terrain interaction in games 
is pretty underused. I think despite, you know, we're, we're in the very modern era of games now, you know, the 2020s, I feel like even in a lot of modern games, um, train, uh, terrain destruction or terrain manipulation in games that don't actually hyper-focus on that element is still a very underused factor. And seeing an RTS is very cool. Um, it'd be interesting to see if there was any like um, forest regrowth mechanics or uh, water-based mechanics or anything like that. I don't know if there's any uh, transport ship lovers in the chat or something from some weird Warcraft 3 maps um, <laughs> with boats and stuff. Um, but so far, it's cool. And the fact that it's a single unit that actually does that, you know, just charging through a tree line that is, um, I guess, perhaps those trees specifically are ones that are marked, you know, because I think somebody described, I'm not sure if it was one of the presenters or um, it was during the the presentation, if certain areas of the trees are described as, say, the light forest, which makes them traversable by smaller units and destructible by larger units, or can all terrain be manipulated in this way? I'd imagine probably not. Um, I do have a concern for balance in terms of how annoying this could be. For example, light terrain being traversable by smaller units, which could be smaller raiding units or fast units that could hit your base and then travel straight back to the tree line I can already envision that being really annoying. Uh, I need a Bucky. No lame, no more lames in the chat right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, I mean, that could be highly abusive and highly annoying. Um, but that, as if you pointed out, Dondelar, that could be solved with you know just good map design. And I think over over time, of course, uh, players will weed out which maps they like best for competitive play. Can be fixed by map design to a certain degree, though. I think like the example that showcases that you have to somewhat limit how you design units if you're going to do systems like this is struggling in StarCraft 2. I think a lot of the stuff that people, especially from the outside or even in the StarCraft 2 community, don't like as much. I think for, uh, for uh, force fields in the early time periods, uh, Widow Mines probably the most like hated concept, I think, in StarCraft 2. Um, all derived from Struglings being very, very fast and you having creep. So like map map designs were so advantageous for like struggling as a movement option. Then you needed something to counter that. So you need like some just mass killing machines that punish people that just multitask without looking at right. So there is a small risk of interacting inter, interesting map interaction uh, being too good for certain kinds of units and stuff. So it does limit maybe something what like to how much you can do. Uh, for instance. Uh, and force a very mobile unit into the game because it's so advantageous for them if you can backdoor bases compared to other stuff. There are it does enforce some limitations. Probably one of the reasons why it hasn't been that like uh, utilized in uh, RTS games before because it removes a possible headache by just not having it. I guess, but I I do think one should try, right? Yeah, that's very fair. All right, we'll see if uh, people abuse this. Like, for example, in this tiny little clip that we had, where we see for the first time that the units can walk through the trees uh, when they attack Monk's base for the first time, and then he he's saved by the Vulcans. Um, what prevents the gunner people to just stand in the forest where nothing can see them to keep on attacking? Like, that's... Interesting to me. Yeah, because presumably they could just back into the forest, but not all the way. But yeah. then they'll still be shot down, I assume. Because look how far the Vulcans can travel into the tree line. So I imagine they would still, the, the Exo soldiers, for example, would still get attacked. Hopefully. Like you would still be, both targets would still be able to hit the other, presumably, in that case. Um, but if there are any sort of long range units, you know, uh, like sniper units, then that would be insane. Like a ghost? Like, I was just thinking of ghosts, yeah. <laughs> ghost recording. Because you... It's, oh, such a, one of my favorite units, even though I barely know StarCraft 2. Uh, very, very cool. But um, yeah, no. Please no. Basically. Yeah, <laughs> and that also, would be super annoying. Also, if you add on top, and I, this hasn't been shown at all, obviously, so far. We just have one faction. But infiltration, you know, any invisibility type effects which obviously are very prevalent in starcraft 2 and extremely irritating in like the 20 games i played of it um that's just no fun at all so hopefully that doesn't get mixed in too too much as well long range and invisible and there's terrain that they can cross but other units can't Oof, 
Uy, uy, uy. Yeah. All right, what was next on the map? Um, early game scouting oh. is, I think... This is like a thing I find interesting, but it might be very nerdy. Yeah, go ahead. Kind of... Nerd out. <laughs> Let's nerd. That's what we're here for. Well, the logic that you need something during the early game makes sense immediately. But then I'll, I started thinking about... Mm, well, you want to do some cheese. Neo is like in the mood, right? He's uh, he's lost three games in a row, and he just wants to cheese the hell out of someone. That's pretty impossible to do if you have a very fast scout unit appearing in your opponent's base like for one minute. And in Age of Empires 2, is the unit, I think is where they basically copied it. Maybe they did it in Command and Conquer as well, but Age of Empires 2 did it. But that's Age of Empires 2 is especially important maps for very big usually and you need to know like placement of stuff not necessarily even what the guy's doing you just need to wear like know the gold mine is so you can build like your stuff it, it is a very like strategic importance in that game in a more like blistered rts game i just feel like it might just punish severely more cheesy openings but also might reduce strategic variance in general right because the perfect like cheese balance is you do some cheesy stuff you can do a risk, semi-risky opening and scout it early enough. You do sacrifice something by sending something to scout, and you, but you can counter it. You have to do like some precise actions, but you can counter it. Or you can be very like greedy and just hope it doesn't dust this one thing that's just going to kill you. I think that's perfectly fine. It's, I think that's just okay. I mean, I think you should be punished if you do greedy stuff, right? I think what we'll see here is maybe that... Okay, of course, if you're extremely greedy, you might still lose even if you scout, right? But you're going to probably get like this semi-greedy macro thing because everyone's going to know, or I think strategic variance is going to be smaller because you always know very fast what your opponent's doing from the get-go, right? So I'm, I'm not immediately sure that it's good that you get like a fast scout without sacrificing it. At least when you send out an SCV or a worker or a footman or something, you sacrifice creeping speed, you sacrifice economy in StarCraft 2. You, that you have to make some semi decisions before you like know everything. I think it's actually okay. I don't. I'm not sure it's a good thing that like everything uh, is like yeah, immediately mapped out because you can scout everything for your opponent, right? No, I think it's so, a great point. A great point because in StarCraft Two and WarCraft Three, there's an immediate opportunity cost, whether that be economical or creeping speed, you know, in whichever game. Um, and in AoE. And also in Age of Mythology, which is in the game I could really comment on as well. You start off with a scout unit, but you have to scout other things that are important to your game plan. For example, where can I get a source of hunt? Where are my gold mines? Where's my next settlement? Which is where you can construct a town center, which is a second base, basically. Your scout has to do all of that as well as check your opponent's initial build. And the scout can't keep hovering around the base constantly because the maps tend to be very large. You have to scout your own area, whereas, as we're seeing so far at least, it's hard to get a grasp of how big the maps are exactly, you know, from just what we saw in the the minimap indicator. But yeah, the fact that you will start with a scout that appears to be very fast it also can extend its range as well with how much it sees. It may just nullify any sort of greed, you know, any sort of tech, greedy tech build or... Um, cheese build, you know, with making additional military buildings in the early game or whatever it might be. Uh, so I do share that point with you as well, Dondo. I think there's a general point that like people say that RTS has like one resource that people often forget about, but it's probably the main resource, and that's visibility in general. Like just knowing what your opponent does makes the game a lot more easy, right? And if you uh, make, you basically make that very cheap for people. With having a very fast immediate unit instead of having a worker that can get caught up, killed, stuff like that, right? So yeah, I think it's an interesting point that they, they might have underestimated the importance, like, of okay, it's cool to have something done in the early game versus the actual importance of knowing what happens. Like, I think yeah, they kind of took it from Age of Empires or Command and Conquer, but they kind of also didn't do the translate. In my head, they didn't do maybe the full translation of what that entails for build variety in game more starcraft warcraft ish games yeah it's going to be interesting i mean you could make the argument since we saw that the scout can fight you give up a little bit of your base defense or even creep speed when you send the scout out but that should be pretty minimal i'd say so yeah i uh i, th I think you're right with that there could be something like there could be like a 
let's say a standard opener where you use the scout to take your first camp and that gives you a nice boost into the early game maybe it allows you to hit a certain tech timing that will be standard in every game or wow, something like that so if you choose to be more aggressive with it um or you choose to leave it on your opponent's side of the map in order to keep obtaining information about what they're doing your opponent may just use their scout to either defend and it's sort of a net neutral for both players really well i guess for one person if they defend it's kind of bad because they won't know what the other guy is doing but also you know maybe it will be used for creeping as well so yeah, I'm, I'm not so sure about having the immediate scout unit as well, to be honest. Basically, it's what it boils down to. All right, are you finished nerding out about scouting, Dondo? Are hey, you... yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> uh, I think this is a very, very good, good point that uh, at first we all thought like, okay, cool, we have a scout, that's nice. But yeah, it takes a strategic element away and that is indeed dangerous in game design. Uh, we talked about lack of RNG. Map design we touched as well. Uh, next on your list, variety. Why two factions at release might be a bad idea. Uh, I'm pretty sure they confirmed that it's going to be more than two. Yeah, I thought it was going to be two at release, but I heard that it's going to be three. Because I, yeah. I just imagine a situation where you play 50% mirrors or 3v3s with three players of the same race. <laughs> Possibly six players. I mean, it's just, that sounds, I think people will get bored pretty fast. But uh I, people always hate mirrors, right? I, I'm the guy who don't, but I think people usually hate mirrors in most uh, RTS games. So yeah. Also, it would good be to a, not have full mirror matchups all the time. It would be a big uh, balance factor in the in the uh, three and three because if you have a team with two times the race that Todd plays, it's automatically going to be worse. <laughs> Precisely. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, do you have a vision for the third race? There's so many different concepts you could draw from, isn't there? Um, I think to create something completely original is extremely difficult. You know, as as time moves on, um, even if it's from a different game entirely, like genre entirely, it will still most likely be drawing inspiration from something, regardless of what you do. Um, it'd be kind of cool to see something that's maybe a bit like really, really weird, like Lovecraftian or something like that. I don't know. That would be kind of spooky. And weird. I, th I saw some people writing funny comments like "space Vikings" and you know other uh, other weird <laughs> stuff like that. Actually, um, that's so funny. I made a little joke in the interview with uh, Monk that the human resistance thing is definitely Terran, and the demons are definitely Diablo. So the third faction has to be Warcraft. But he twisted it a little bit and said it's going to be like Lost Vikings. And someone on the Stormgate <laughs> read it. Someone on the Stormgate read it and said, "Oh, is." Is that confirmed now? Is it really going to be Space Vikings? No, it was just, a, so jo was just a joke, but <laughs> would be kind of cool. Yeah, it'd be kind of cool, dude. But um, yeah, no, I definitely don't, for me, I've not given any much consideration to okay. that, what the actual third or fourth race is. It would be cool to have four. I think four is kind of a sweet spot in terms of just generally how interesting the game would be, but obviously it creates more complications in terms of balancing, for sure. Four is... As you know, with Warcraft, four is it's tough, um, but it gives the game such life to have four different races as well. Obviously, if you could go more and more and more, it'd be cool. But you know, we don't introduce insane levels of complexity with balancing so many races to be remotely, you know, fair in a competitive setting. But yeah, if something, you, if you want... something alien like perhaps, yeah. If you want variety in team composition, if three v three is the thing they hope to become pretty big, yeah, you kind of need four, right? Or else you just, everything is going to be like different variations of the same. With four, you get like the almost, there's always an X factor if they have that additional race or not. Which I think will be, would be good if they have like that as a goal. I, and I also think like balance, if a game is widely supported, balance can both be like, you can aim for the perfect balance at like an, of all, uh, at every time, or you can live with the more volatile stuff like okay this at this point it was a bit uh in there that but that i think uh, mobus works like that right they have but they have bands of picks of course but it does like some heroes are stronger at certain points but since the game is updated that frequently people can live with it i think the worst case scenario is like semi-balanced but also a long time between changes right i think that's like the thing we're kind of wanting wanting to avoid so i don't think four races like from a bounce perspective should be seen as like impossible aoe has even though they're not racist the, the advantages for each faction actually matters quite a lot and you have so many of them and there are sometimes like 
things that are just like busted completely, but then it gets patched like a month later, so it's or two weeks yeah. later, even. So it's it's okay. Uh, I want to see something nature stuff. I don't, I don't want to see night elves, but I oh, do want to see not? something nature. But... You, you, uh, we I, two I, talked so much about night elves in the past six months. You, you must have some kind well, of fetish. First of all, I, I want to maybe see something a bit more original. That's one thing. Also, I struggle that so hard against night elves. It's, it's, it's a personal trauma thing for me. <laughs> but you, do you want to? So you would like to remove the elven component, presumably, and have yeah, it be I, something I, that's that more feels, actual uh, raw nature, perhaps. Yeah, feel, that feels maybe a bit like tired, uh, right? I feel because elven is just like you put people. In nature, I kind of yeah. wish just like pure nature would be more interesting to me. So sort of uh, like I don't know if you're familiar with Heroes of Might and Magic, which is one of my other favorite RTSs. Oh, RTS oh I am. But I am maybe, both familiar. I what say about that. say say Conflux from Home Three, for example? Yeah, yeah. Take Psychic like Adam elemental Parsons. fire, earth. You know, I mean, of course, they do it a very boring way as well. Like it's just fire, earth, air. Uh, psychic is cool. Magma, I think, is another one as well, which is sort of basically fire and rock. So you know, not super original. But maybe a similar concept, right? You're taking like actual raw elements together. You could have like ent like units or horns from Lord of the Rings. You know, you could, yeah. That would be interesting to see something that's definitely like a really organic race. You know, that isn't just we are wood people that command the elements, <laughs> you know, with pointy ears. We could remove that aspect perhaps. And I think every game has room for like a super advanced the space race. Just do something a bit maybe like different than. And Protoss, but you can. There's like so many possibilities along that dimension as well, which I think can always be cool, right? So yeah, yeah. That um, brings us to another point that would be cool. And so far, the reactions have been the crowd goes mild. So do we need a bigger wow factor for Stormgate? Yeah, I, I'm not sure how you would make it though. That, I mean, that, that is for me like the games I. Grew up like I watched the trailers. I got extremely happy. It's kind of hard to go back in time and like, why did you do it? But I do. I like. I do generally feel like there's the consensus has been, we do like the wow factor a bit. I also that might just be like they have gone more the technical route of like we, this is like the game should be as a technical prospect, stuff, right? which does interest the programmers but doesn't invoke the mysterious feelings we've been talking a bit about. Yeah, we do need some more uh, wowsers. I I think. I feel so too, especially when we compare it to the StarCraft gameplay reveal. I had this huge wow factor when I saw the huge Protoss unit that can walk over terrain. Because A, it looked super cool. It had two giant lasers. Plus it showed me that you can walk over cliffs, which wasn't a thing in either StarCraft Brute War or Warcraft 3. So that was like three wow factors in one little presentation. And for whatever they show us next, whenever they show us next, something like this has to happen. So uh, a little bit more dwarf in the next Storm game <laughs> presentation, yeah. I think. I mean, MOBAs also got this for free. Heroes are in itself a cool concept. They have individuality. And you can just put a bunch of like heroes fighting in the middle with huge explosions, right? And someone blinks out and then chains them back in again. So... Trading them are uh, pretty easy in that game, right? So I think most games have like this, uh, do use these like wire factors to drag people in. And then of course, at your 20,000 ladder game, they kind of become mundane as well. But uh, in the start, right, you need something to emotionally pull you in, in general. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um... I think, you know, as we, we said at the very beginning, or at least I stayed at the start, you know, the, the gameplay trailer was quite, Mechanical was focused on, you know, just how does the game work on a kind of base level. And now for the next thing, you know, I think we would all like to see something that's a bit more action packed, shows off unique mechanics. And one point that you were speaking about a lot, Neo, is like what makes Stormgate Stormgate? That needs to be tied in perhaps to another like gameplay demonstration so we can really see what's super cool about Stormgate. Yeah, you uh, you also mentioned um, emotional investment or being drawn in. Are you drawn in at the moment, or are you just uh, curious from the sidelines? Um, it's, it's a difficult question to, to answer. I mean, because I'm, I I want to see. Obviously, before, first of all, I want Stormgate to be a success. Obviously, we, we we all want to see a new RTS breathe life into the the genre itself. 
to rejuvenate it a little bit. So obviously I want it to do well. And of course I am curious, but I'm, there isn't a, a hook quite yet. But I think that's to be expected given that obviously the airtime was short. It was just a gameplay reveal. Um, there are a lot of things obviously not finished and it was only showing one faction. So, um, you know, a couple, let's say one or two more bigger trailers down the line that perhaps don't even necessarily need to feature on something, you know, on a show where they have a limited airtime. Um, I could go into detail about a few more cool things that, of course, a lot more people are going to be like, wow, that's super awesome. And that will be like a hook, uh, you know, to um, keep people interested or to stir even more interest, I should say, rather. Yeah, I mean, I, I can be the guy. I can give them a challenge, like enthuse me a bit more, maybe. I can I can be like the guy they're trying to convince to a certain degree. I, I find the game like interesting just from being an artist. And I, I am pretty convinced by like, people behind it and all the technical aspects and stuff but i i, I mean i and of course they don't have that budget so they can't do like the blizzard cinematics and stuff they just like they just have like this emotional pincers right just freak you immediately but the, they do still lack something there which i'm i'm not sure how they're going to do it but they need like something to make you feel like why should i play stormgate beside it being a good like, a very good design game there's a i think there's like a scrap heap of a lot of very cleverly designed games out there but people just didn't care that much about so I, I that is like an important factor i they have great campaign manager and stuff so i probably will get smoothed out but i think it would be smart to probably like try to pivot a bit in that direction because the focus so far has been very much on like the technical aspects and 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 going towards more hardcore games right the games people i want to like see how's the one we won but uh yeah i think most people will start with the campaign and have like a feeling so they need to start showing us that i feel just have fun because you mentioned the campaign i just have another thing to add about todd he's never played the campaign of warcraft 3. what the hell he was like no nah, i just went straight into playing competitive 1v1 i was like bro <laughs> how do you learn the units i don't know that, that's that's what i find fascinating too <laughs> and last year when i was living in the caravan as you might recall I um I tried a little bit of StarCraft too, right? Because I'd never played it, and I didn't play the campaign. I just tried the because you have to pay for the campaign, right? As well, that was monetized, which I think Stormgate is following a similar approach, right? They're going to monetize campaign packs and stuff like that. I can't remember if that was said. Um, I could be wrong entirely. Um, but yeah, also it doesn't help when you actually go into like a competitive game, ranked or unranked, whatever, and you just don't know what anything does or what anything does thematically. You know, yeah. it's super confusing. So yeah, most people will definitely go towards the campaign first, I'd imagine. Yeah, I am um, touching back a little bit on on that they mentioned so many technical aspects because we diehard RTS people, they sold the game on us when they said who's building the game. The Mongs and the Tim Campbells, etc. Uh, but so far, they've only appealed to us with the technical side of things, with how good it feels. In the future... And maybe that is a marketing budget uh, thing and they will do this later on, but they have to appeal more to casuals, to people who abandoned the RTS genre for MOBAs or Battle Royals or whatever. Little concerned that they forget about that aspect a little bit. Yeah, I mean, cause they have this also, we're going to make the first social RTS game, right? Which, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't mind as a concept, but if you I, the games that I like when you think of social, I, I sometimes also think that it's a bit like overrated. I don't think so many LOL and Dota players actually are in voice chat together, and I, most people don't have on public voice chat at least for kind of games like that. For that's, reasons, uh, I guess. That's many reasons. Yeah. yeah. So, but, but, but that so doesn't bad. say like you can't play with friends. I feel like the the last year is the funnest like co-op experience I had. And uh, probably it was like the early days. Even the game was completely busted and broken. Technically, it was the early days of PUBG. Just because the story has built in story creation with your team, right? So you're basically landing, you're four people, you want to survive. People scream at each other, panic, stuff. I mean, the game has like very built in that kind of story, social element. I'm not sure RTS games will ever have that same built in social aspect of like the game. It's just something with the game flow that is a bit separate from our, in RTS games. 
So they do need to drag players into like the world feels cool. I like these units. I like this like whole environment and stuff we're doing. I think <clears> what <throat> yeah. does a really good job as that is uh, this little mascot for the infernal host. In yeah. host. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Where you're looking that up, which I haven't seen myself, is I think the co-op game mode will be the perfect place to also instill that feeling in people, right? Because with co-op, you can go so big with concepts. Um, not only will you control probably a unique faction, you know, a unique mutation of a base faction, kind of like you do in StarCraft 2, um, but, you know, you could, you'll have custom objectives, different units, um, obviously things to do on the map and stuff that will be totally different. And that will be more social because you are literally working together as opposed to, you know, on the other side. But yeah, Infernal Imp Worker, he's very cute, isn't he? Exactly. So like this was revealed and everybody was very, oh, I want this as a plushie. I want this as a whatever. Um, yeah. The, the immediate reaction to something like this, this had apparently a big appeal to a lot of people. So yeah, that route more is, I think, uh, pretty smart for them. Totally agree. Yeah, and I think also that's harder to do with a race, for example, like the human resistance, which has Absolutely. the more generic aspects, which is completely fine to have in a game. I think it's good for almost any game to have something that's relatable to ourselves, homo sapiens, you know, that sort <laughs> of is like, that's what they do. And they're like the industrious, you know, hardworking guys that, you know, could get to like text like mech and you know bio healing mechanics and stuff like that but doesn't reach the pinnacle of like psychic powers you know like with protoss and zergs just being disgusting and creating creep everywhere and stuff like that i guess <laughs> whatever they, i guess they they, they kind of tried with the turret if you look at the bob at the worker that smiley face head uh is going into that direction also they gave him a dog like Yep. That is the plushy factor there with the humans, and that's probably as much as you can do for a human race in that regard. Yeah, I mean, yeah. other other RTS games or list RTS, we have this built-in notion also that like Terran is there's there, they have this like grim dark elements, right? We we know from default that they're like barely surviving in this very hostile world, right? So it also gives like some sympathy and makes it easy to make like these rough characters, Rainer then pike and stuff people like that right but since it's not built in yet it kind of feels a bit bland when you see it um True. compared to those like games and because it feels like more of a set universe and we don't know what the set universe is yet and it's not that long until the game comes out so i want to know what the set universe is yeah i feel like there's so many ways you could start trying to hook people in do we want to see like more advanced concepts about the gameplay itself introducing the second faction or is it going to be like more lore focused and like this is the world that Stormgate exists in and start building characters, you know, actually, you know, character development and like these are the factions that are pitted against one another or what cataclysmic event is taking place because I think that's something that happened in Stormgate and that's why the Stormgate exists, whatever that means, where presumably the Infernal Host came through and stuff like that. Um, you know, we could extrapolate basic things like that, but seeing it actually be fleshed out, I think would be would be huge too. And that's something I guess we should expect, you know, further down the line in the next few months at least. All right. Then I guess we're most oh, we have another uh page. I kinda lost track of where we are at the R document, Dondo. Did you have little <laughs> little check marks on the topics? No, I think we've kind of gone through at least my document. So uh, if you didn't go and say I have anything, I was thinking, I mean, there was a couple of points that people are like, of course, as usual, overboard with X, like, this game is going to be the worst ever, or this game is going to be the best ever. I screenshot like a picture the second the gameplay reveal started on your stream, Neo, with like, game looks terrible in like one <laughs> second after, right? It's just, it's just, everything feels a bit entitled in all directions. So, I mean, that's just the way it is. Um, so I mean, it's uh, we need to calm down a bit, probably. I feel like it's a general point, but we also, I mean, I'm going to be devil's advocate and also say there's been a lot of uh, built-in hype from the people behind it, right? So um, I don't think it's completely fair to just be like, why are people, why do people have expectations? We heard terms like revolutionize and uh, 
And from the creators of the best games ever, only this game is going to be 10 times better. Like, so when you do that, you kind of make that expectation go higher. And I think, I mean, in the end, I think actually it's a good thing. I think that people have high expectations only means that they have high expectations. That does even this sound critical, they will try it, I think. Just, just yeah, they have, they have some emotional investment into the game. Yeah, no, um, it's pretty hard to add to that, honestly. It's um, it's it's tough, though, isn't it? Because it's like there there are these expectations that have been created by Frost Giant themselves, and also I think RTS gamers in general at this point, we're all kind of like we've waited twenty years to actually get like an RTS that's better than the game we currently play. You know what I mean? Um, or for StarCraft gamers, it's been over a decade, so. That's a long, long time to wait for something that supersedes the game that they still play to this day, especially for Warcraft players, obviously. It's just ridiculous. Um, so yeah, expectations are going to be high. And um, I just just hope they can deliver. That's all. All right. I hope when they uh, drop some new content, I can invite you guys again to talk about it. <laughs> Double thumbs up, wonderful. All right, guys, then we close this. More than 100 minutes, uh, a lot of talk. Very good insights, very good concern, very good praise where it was due. Uh, if you guys want to do any shout outs, if you want to plug your socials, your OnlyFans, uh, this is your chance now, Dondo. <laughs> well, I don't, well, I'm not going to dox myself, so no, I prefer <laughs> not. To, and I also don't have an OnlyFans, should probably be the thing I started with there. <laughs> Are you kidding? I'm I'm a, I'm a tier one Dondolari only fan so. <laughs> No, I mean I mean I, I don't have the I, we have like communist people you know in Warcraft, Jim. I think they are fairly well known, but yeah, Jim Discord stuff like that talk about Warcraft. But I generally just I don't know. I think it's cool that we still have uh, vivid or live uh, and vivid uh, RTS community. So just uh, yeah, just uh, hi to everyone and just yeah. It's cool to be part of still a live game, and it's cool to discuss Stormgit. I think I I know people kind of feel we're over discussing stuff, but I also think it's it's cool that we have something to talk about. And I think all good feedback is actually listened to by the developers, even from smaller people like me, the Cubert, you're a giant. I'm not gonna say no, you're, not. you're a giant. You're a mental giant. So I think it's good that we do, it's, it's a good thing that we do these things, right? To talk, I think they actually listen. I think everyone, if they write good posts and stuff, they're gonna be listened to. So do that. You know, that's a great point. Um, I think, you know, it's been emphasized before Frost, by Frost Giant Studios. You know, we need uh, feedback that makes sense, that's cohesively written, you know, that's understandable um, easily, that isn't, you know, too too convoluted, um, and that it also doesn't actually address anything constructively. Um, so that would be very important down the line as well, presumably after, you know, closed beta and then, you know, alpha as well, which hopefully won't be too, too far away. Of course, the closed beta, I think, is in July, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? Um, so that would be very exciting too. Um, and yeah, just uh, first of all, Shared Neil, thank you very much for having us again on your platform, man. It's been great. Um, shout out to the Gym Discord, of course, as well. Uh, place that uh, I got to be a part of when I rejoined the game again. And of course, shout out to my new team, Phantom Aces. You're my boys. Thank you very much for having me. And um, yeah, it's been a great talk. I look forward to more developments further down the line, guys. All right, Monk, get to work. Uh, we'll go back to <laughs> Warcraft, like the channel name suggests. This was like three days, three and a half full of Stormgate talk and a little bit of Warcraft. We will shift more towards Warcraft in the upcoming days. Tomorrow is the uh, no smoke, non-smoking cup, no smoking cup. I always forget. Number five, Remo's gonna uh, stream it for you at 7 p.m. I will uh, probably cast some Flow TV games tomorrow afternoon, just like I did today, and talk about uh, all things relating to Warcraft 3. So take care, guys. Hope you enjoyed this. Uh, sub to the channel, hit the like button, hit the bell, backtowarcraft.com slash support, all those things. Good night.